is that a lot of parents of these students feel very isolated. Um, and so because of that, they aren't as involved in their students' education. Uh, what would you propose that the county can do in order to act uh, to have these parents become more active? I'm also a first generation American. My father came from Poland uh, after the Second War. Uh, he didn't know English. Uh, he, uh, he went to classes, learned English, got a job that was very below him. He was a, uh, uh, he was, uh, a uh, physician and he ended up coming to America and working in a uh, foundry. Uh, four to twelve. My, my wife, I'm sorry, my mother uh, worked midnight at the hospital just so that someone would be home with, with me in the evening. Um, they had challenges too. And I think we could work through them. Uh, we, one, one point was when uh, I was re getting ready for college. They had no idea. Uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do, what way he wanted to do. And there really wasn't anybody to help us. I did go to college. I graduated. It's fine. But I really wish there was somebody else to, to help. Uh, I think through our, uh, our the website, I think it's a great idea. What we have is, uh, I don't know if you know, but, well, I'm sure you know, but um, Google Translate. You could read our whole website in any language you want. And that's really, really powerful. Because now you've, you've presented to the person what he needs to know or she needs to know, and then now they need to find someone to, to take it further. And uh, that's where things like, um, um, we have bilingual facilitators to help them. And we don't have enough, but I'm sure we can get some kind of, uh, oh, I don't know, call center or something to that effect that uh, would be able to help people find the correct direction and move forward. Um, let me see if I did everything here. Um, also, career training. Um, as I said before, my problem was I had no idea. I don't care. But um, uh, we need people to help guide our students to find the correct career path so that they can uh, uh, establish a good life in this society. Thank you so much. You actually answered what my follow-up question was going to be as well. OK. Well, done. Hi, my name is Josie Ray, and I represent the Chesapeake Regional Association of Student Councils. Um, so you mentioned iPads in the school, and then um, IEPs for everyone, and then you also say in your application, uh, answering number two, um, increasing the support staff to work with educators. How would you find funding for all these ideas? Well, it goes into a bigger question. I, I talked about uh, private uh, partnerships. If you look at the... Um, if you look at the businesses, they pay a lot for uh, in-house training to develop uh, uh, people to understand their processes and um, learn tasks, that type of thing. I don't know why the school district couldn't do something like that. Uh, we, went to, uh, we went to Germany, and I mentioned that in my uh, class, I mean in my uh, statement, and um, they had a great system. They decided. A student, the parent, the school decided which path to take a student, vocational, university, or business. And then they really worked hard. Mercedes came over, and around um, uh, middle school uh, attracted these children. Their parents agreed. Uh, they set up a uh, school. Uh, that school decided to teach everything about Mercedes. Uh, let's say um, a good example would be is there's not a um, there's not an English nut in a Mercedes. They're all uh, millimeter. So why would you even teach the English conversion? Because this is what uh, this is what's necessary for that company. But anyways, they would go through that and then also have a job ready at the end of that uh, of that training program. And of course, they'd have a great uh, great employee. Um, I, I don't know why America can't do something like that. Okay, and specifically to um, supporting stu uh, teachers with uh, support staff, could you expand on that? Okay, 
Uh, it would be very hard to support each teacher with an individual support staff. But why couldn't we look at it from a uh, grade level uh, uh, concept? Whereas, let's say we have uh, two or three para, uh, paraprofessionals doing all the uh, all the work, uh, uh, writing on ba uh, writing on blackboards the uh, uh, the goals of the next day. Uh, again, looking at uh, test scores, uh, looking at tests, coming up with scores, um, individual work with the students. Uh, maybe you have a student uh, uh, that needs additional uh, additional help and the teacher can't do it, she's got 30, 30 uh, people. But if you could have a two or three para, paraprofessionals that can identify the children in that grade level and then attach themselves to those children to, to help them succeed. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, sir. My name is Allison Pickard and I'm with the Anne Arundel County Council of PTAs. Good evening. Uh, my question for you is regarding parent involvement and if if appointed to the board um, how, what do you think you would do to increase uh, or foster parent involvement across the county I um, I hear there's 110 PTAs um, I like to visit them I like to visit them at least once a month uh, maybe two, uh, maybe once every second month, depending on my schedule, and bringing the PTAs in and and um, keeping aware of what their needs are, to go over and listen to them, and see what uh, what they feel. Uh, maybe the building's not right. Maybe the uh, uh, they're having a problem with the uh, uh, administration. Um, maybe the bus isn't coming on time. You know, and uh, that way we can. Uh, develop a conversation uh, with the uh, with the community and then we could use it as a board to make uh, recommendations great thank you and then uh, as a second question since we still have a little time what are your thoughts on comprehensive redistricting in the county uh, I'm, a, I'm a community uh, community-based school person I think uh, I think rather than redistricting I'd like to put uh, uh, buildings together, uh, maybe 100 students, uh, maybe f two or three grade levels. And again, those types of things could be sponsored by uh, the, the uh, business community. Um, let's say uh, Boeing would like to, uh, uh, to offer a charter school. Be a great idea. Um, maybe the boating industry, that's another thing. Uh, we have no boating programs, but did you notice in Annapolis we have a lot of boating? There's no boat building. Maybe we can get one of the boat builders to uh, come up with a school to be uh, a training, um, a training, uh, a boy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, training partnership, um, interns, that's what I was coming up with, I'm sorry. Um, but those are the kind of uh, ideas that the boards has to, to, to look at because uh, we're changing all the time. I mean, I, I don't believe that there will be uh, large buildings in the future. I believe that, again, you could do everything from your iPad. Uh, I think you'll need to have interaction with a professional to guide you through your, your, your system, but uh, housing 2,000 students, uh, we should be able to get away from that and maybe break it up into 10 schools at uh, 100 students apiece. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Janowski, my name is Jerry Klasmeyer. Yes, sir. And I'm here from the uh, Anne Arundel County Community College Board of Trustees. Yes, sir. The only question I have is a, 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 an opportunity for you to elaborate on your suggestion about your goals. You say better prepare our youth for the jobs of tomorrow. Implicit in your suggestion is that we're not doing a very good job now? Uh, kinda. Okay. Kinda. We need to expand voca vocational tr training immensely. Um, that's where the jobs are gonna be tomorrow. We don't need doctors, lawyers um, type things. Uh, and, and we'll have them. People will come up and they'll be that. But that's not everybody. Everybody is the guy who built, built, fixes your boat. 
the guy who builds your house, the bricklayer, uh, the plumber. Get a plumber. These people make big money. Um, why don't we have more plumbers? This is the kind of stuff we have to look at on uh, looking at our education system. Why, why can't we have a wide range of, of uh, support for abilities, not only through the college, but uh, through a technical school, through a, uh, an internship, something like that, because we're all going to make a living. We might as well find something that we really enjoy doing and then get the information as much as we can and have a good life. The only other question I have, Mr. Janofsky, as a sitting board member for the community college, I know how much time is required, not only for the formal meetings, but to prepare for the formal meetings. Are you comfortable with the time commitment that's going to be associated with uh, serving on the board? If you're appointed? Yeah, I'm retired right now. Uh, I, I'm very retired. I was retired 10 years ago. But every once in a while, I get a uh, get something going, and uh, I end up getting taking a new job. But um, I'm I'm just excited. I was a board member before. I know that there's, uh, as I told you, 100 PTAs here I can go see. Uh, I'm sure that there'll be five or six phone calls of, I don't know, uh, a child missed the bus, uh, um, something that uh, is going to have me uh, help uh, uh, people in my district. Uh, achieve problems, uh, or not achieve problems, but I mean uh, resolve problems. Um, no, I'm, I'm good with that. I, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you'll see me at most every meeting. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Linda Ferrara, and I'm representing the Association of Educational Leaders, which is the administration of Anne Arundel County. I have a three-part question. The first part is define consensus. Second part is how do you build consensus? And the third part is give me an example of how you were able to do this. As you heard earlier, um, first generation Polish uh, descent. Um, I was a board member. I don't know why they didn't teach Polish in our, call, or in our high school. Our, our community was probably 30 to 40 percent Polish, and the other uh, uh, 30 percent was maybe Slovak, which is very similar in, in language. Uh, so what I did is I, I talked to the German uh, teacher, Bob Blasek, and Bob thought that was a good idea, that maybe we should try another Slovak or Slavonian language. So we worked with Bob. Uh, we went to the principal principal understood it. We had to get Bob uh, uh, certified in a, in a language and um, then, of course, get the board to approve five votes to, to put that program in. Um, I kind of got everything I need. We ended up teaching Slovak, not Polish. But that's okay. I got the language that I needed uh, or uh, the, the, the program that I needed in a similar language and it helped the entire community. That's the best I can do. Thank you. Yes. Hi, good evening. I'm Penny Cantwell and I'm representing the Central Maryland Chamber of Commerce. And I would like you to share with us tonight your vision or a description of what a successful student in Anne Arundel County Public Schools would look like. I think a successful student would be able to be a critical thinker. Um, he or she uh, would be able to gather facts and, and, and um, present a good life for themselves. Uh, I think we, what we have to do is not only teach the facts, but we have to give the children the tools to, uh, to grow, to uh, uh, make their lives better and, and go in the direction that they want to go. Um, that would be, that would be a good thing. Uh, I, I, I think we all contribute to the common society in any, in any aspect of life where 
we might be at a different level than someone else, but we all have uh, something to give. And to create that feeling in a student and move that on to a citizen, that's powerful. It's got to be good. Thank you. You're welcome, Pitt. I'm Emily Brandenburg. I'm a, a county executive appointee, and my usual question is about the role and responsibility of a board member. But during your opening statement, you had shared that you had spent many years on public school system boards and yes. um, other boards. So no question from me, but thank you very much for putting your application in and coming out tonight. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Janoski. My name is Ginger Vance, and I represent the Anne Arundel Chamber of Commerce. Yes. And uh, similar to my commissioner here, you have answered Josie's and another commissioner's questions with your comments about private partnership and mm -hmm. getting more involved and engaging with activities uh, to help the school system. So my questions were already asked and answered as well. So thank you for your time. Would you mind, Ginger, if I mentioned something that I had forgotten that would fit I here? I have three minutes that you can use. Okay. Be my guest. I have two bills in front of me. They were signed by the governor last year. One is uh, the apprentice, Apprenticeship and Training Council, where he opens up the, uh, uh, the opportunities for apprenticeship uh, training uh, through, the, through the government, not through a council. Uh, the other one that's more important is the Maryland Jobs for, uh, More Jobs for Maryland Act. That was approved by the governor, and that gives a million dollars every year so that the governor would be able to find businesses to want to uh, to work with the school districts to develop curriculum uh, to uh, uh, use uh, use our resources to uh, help their businesses uh, perfect Avenue perfect the only thing is we need more than a million dollars that's all I can tell you well fortunately we're a county that has extraordinary community colleges that w uh, that that also produce workers that often stay in the area so yeah. that's that's fantastic that's where it is Do you, um, New York just came up all the SUNY colleges up in New York they're free two-year two-year uh, uh, education for free just to be a New York uh, a uh, uh, citizen be nice if we could do that in Maryland I grew we, up in New York they weren't free in 81 oh no 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 <laughs> my what my sister uh, uh, my sister was up for a uh, uh, the president of one of the SUNY colleges, and uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, even even at that level, they get uh, extremely expensive. And I, I don't know why we want to do that to our children. You know, all, all we have to do is use the tax dollars that we get and, and further their education. I, I don't see a problem in that. Um, and that's, that's another one of the situations. Remember I told you that I, I don't understand. I really have to look at how the money comes from council and the state and the federal, uh, and then what their impact are in our programs. Um, I think we, as I said in my opening statement, we could bring uh, our successes to them. Hopefully they understand. Um, and then maybe we'll do better, such as New York and SUNY. Um, but we'll see. You know. Got a couple years. We'll try. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Susanna Kipke. I'm also an appointee of the county executive. And uh, because I'm last so often this happens, all my questions have already been asked and oh, answered. Man, so I, I know. Can I, ask, can I ask you one? I mean, can I bring one question to you? Sure. We were talking about um, how to make consensus. Today on NPR, uh, the, uh, they had talked about uh, Harvard Business Review article about making enemies of your allies. Uh, it was written by Buzz Uzi, and he is a Richard L. Thomas Professor of Leadership and Organizational Change uh, at Northwest Kellogg School of Management and a co-director of the uh, Northwest Institute of Complex Systems. Uh, great article. Uh, what it deals with is coming up with basically the three R's, whether it be uh, in problem solving, uh, course building emotional trust, uh, redirecting your, um, 
your adversary's uh, energies to another area, reciprocating with uh, uh, what you would want them to do, maybe coming out and, and conceding to a point initially, uh, I mean immediately, so as to, to so that they feel more comfortable and not asking anything in return, just, just agreeing that this is what we both should do going forward. And if we could work on that type of situation, we would be able to resolve problems. Uh, the last part was rationality, hopefully that both parties do have that. And uh, just work from that and use, coming from the rationality, moving it from uh, the, um, um, the relationship that you've built, you've built with this person and uh, knowing that uh, he's going to get a fair shake or she's going to get a fair shake, and you are too, and coming up with the answer. Um, great article. Great article. Uh, again, making enemies your ally. Uh, Buzz Uzi. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Oh. That, I'm the last one. I'm the last right. questioner. So. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very uh, much and, for your time. You all. Next, we have Heidi Petras. Good evening. My name is Heidi Petras. Um, I'm interested in applying and joining the board because I believe strongly in our county public school system and would like to be involved in the process of continuing to move our schools forward in a positive and dynamic direction. My education includes a bachelor in psychology and a master's in education. I have worked in nonprofits my entire career, most of it spent working for Youth for Understanding International Exchange, which is an intercultural student exchange program. My current position is that of Associate Director of Support Services. I work in a, a collaborative effort with my colleagues to ensure that our students, families, and volunteers receive the best exchange experience possible. As part of my position, I provide educational trainings to colleagues both in I provide educational trainings to colleagues and staff that include sessions on mediation, cultural awareness, listening skills, new volunteer orientations, and quality assurance, among others. I have lived in Anne Arundel County for the past 19 years with my husband and two daughters. As a resident of the West Annapolis neighborhood, I have served as a general board member and then as the president of the West Annapolis Civic Association, and I continue to be an active community member. My eldest daughter is a rising sophomore at Towson University, and my youngest is a rising junior, junior at Annapolis High School. Both attended West Annapolis Elementary, Bates Middle, and Annapolis High Schools. They participated in the Performing Visual Arts Program at Bates Middle School and the IB Program at Annapolis High School. I have nieces and nephews who are in the Arundel and Annapolis High School feeder clusters as well. I have been an active volunteer in the schools for the past 14 years. I volunteer for the PTSA of all my daughter's schools, including as a treasurer of the Annapolis High School PTSA, and the music boosters there as the vice president. I advocated for the PVA program to be placed at Bates and have watched this program progress from its infancy to the amazing program that it is today. Most recently, I was asked to serve on the board of the AACPS Annapolis Cluster Redistricting Committee and was elected to serve as the chair of this board. I worked to ensure successful working groups who then came together with one final redistricting recommendation, which was unanimously approved by the Anne Arundel Board of Education. I was able to keep the committee focused and on task. I am an excellent listener. I like to hear all sides of an argument before moving towards a solution, as most sides normally have valid discussion points that need consideration. I remain calm during the storm and work with those around me to come to a reasonable and workable outcome. If appointed to the Board of Education, some goals I would like to focus on are recruitment and retention of teachers, expanding programs of choice to areas of the county not currently served, and reducing achievement gap among our Hispanic and African American populations. These are not easy tasks, and I know there are no easy answers as school systems across the country are facing many of the same challenges that our school system is facing. I am hoping, however, to be an advocate for our students, teachers, and parents so that we can provide our children with the best educational experience possible. I believe each school in our system has unique qualities and needs that should be acknowledged moving forward. I hope to help make certain that our public schools in Anne Arundel County can offer and afford our children the opportunities they deserve. Thank you. Well, Ms. Petrus, I'm first at bat again. 
And uh, would you like to stand to take the questions or sit? I'd like to sit, I guess. Okay. I read your submission. I couldn't agree more with your first goal to recruit and retain high quality educators in the county. I agree almost completely with your expansion of that goal as you answered question number two. But to do it requires more revenue than we've been getting. And if you get appointed to the board, I think it is my belief. I know it's my belief. I also believe it's the belief, I'm using the word belief an awful lot. I also believe the majority of the current board members might not be unanimous, but I think the majority also believe that their job is to request a budget that meets the needs of the school system, even if it might be more than what they expect to get. And then the second part of that job would be to advocate for that extra revenue. If you get the appointment, would you be willing to be one of those advocates? I would, yes. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mariko Bennett, and I'm representing the NAACP here this evening. Uh, so read through your application, and um, you made it very clear that um, you wanted to ensure that all students are educated fairly and have access to programs, and uh, we reduce the achievement gap. Um, and so, you know, I have a list of standard questions that I got to ask everyone, but I'm not going to ask you that. I'm going to ask you, what do you think the issue is in the challenge? Why? I mean, this is something that, you know, we've raised. A lot of folks have talked about it. We've said that there is an achievement gap. We recognize that. Um, you're at Annapolis High School, so you mentioned some of the schools that have um, more diversity than others. And so what do you see as the actual challenge as to why we have these achievement gaps, if you will? I think it's a very complex problem. And as I said, it's, there, um, it's a difficult, um, it's difficult. I'm not really, I'm not really certain. I think that some of it tends to be socioeconomic. Some of it tends to be, um, that we have uh, the populations are so diverse. I know at Annapolis High School we have um, about 30, 30, 30 right now between um, black, Hispanic, and white. And um, as I said, I advocated for the middle school program and the program of visual arts. And um, we saw uh, the test scores have shown um, improvement in all populations since we diversified and brought in um, various populations um, of student. And I think some of that includes um, integrating all students into classrooms together, not always separating. Um, they each learn from one another, and to, they learn to understand one another when they're integrated together. Um, but in terms of um, the test scores, I think that's a really complicated question. And I think if, if you know, if we had the answers, I think most systems in the in the country would be working towards them. I think it's. It's an ongoing um, working session that we're dealing with right now, trying to figure that out. Why does this continue? So what I'm hearing, you do, okay, excellent. Thank you for answering that question. So I'm going to ask another question. Um, so what I hear is that you favor racially balanced schools. Is that what I just heard I, that you I do? do? Okay. Yes. And so with that being said, would you use redistricting uh, to ensure that all of our schools were racially balanced? So it's a curious question because I was on the registering committee and um, the city of Annapolis has a lot of small elementary schools. So um, that was a very interesting um, committee to serve on because um, I found that a lot of the parents um, wanted their children to remain in schools that were of the same um, ethnic background, so to speak. Um, and that is inter you know, interesting, but I still believe that as they get older, especially, I think it's, I do feel it's important to integrate. I've, I grew up in a very diverse population in Montgomery County, and I feel it has made me a better person. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Leanne Carmona, and I represent the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, one of your goals, which you just discussed, is to reduce the achievement gap for African-American students and Hispanic students. Um, but I wanted to point out that actually the greatest gap is for students with disabilities. Can you discuss why you left that population out? 
Um, I did discuss, actually, uh, not as a key point, but I did discuss it in my application that I thought that, I, that the um, programs of the IEP are really, um, are quite strong in, in the county system. My daughter actually had an IEP in elementary school for um, speech impediments. And I do think it is an important factor. I, um, I didn't necessarily purposely leave it out. I just think that um, I believe that Anne Arundel County has a really strong program in identifying and working with the kids um, that have special needs. Um, I have the, um, actually, your, your application prompted me to pull up the Maryland report card. Yeah. Um, and just for your information, uh, this is for Maryland, but the, the park testing for fourth grade reading um, below basic, 48% um, of black students are below basic, 46% mm -hmm. um, of Hispanic students are below basic, and 68% of students with disabilities are below basic. So I just wanted to, okay, to share yeah. that with you, yes, um, you because the gap is just so great. It is, yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm mm -hmm. Estefania Holler with the County Council PTA. My question is, have you familiarized, familiarized yourself with the uh, Board of Education handbook we sent. I actually have I read it before I sent my application. Okay, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I wasn't sure. <laughs> it's okay. I was so I'll, I'll give you a little idea. It's mostly because it's such a short term. Mm -hmm. uh, the main thing that I wanted to focus on was the fact that seventy-five percent of attendance for just meetings alone, because of how short the term is. And are you aware of that? And how are you going to work your schedule to be able to not only make meetings but be a public? Um, Face for the Board of Education. Yeah, I actually tell them commute most of the time for my position. I go into Washington DC twice a week and I've actually informed my employer that I'm applying for this position. They're huge advocates of volunteerism because we are a volunteer based organization. Um, so they fully understand my need to be a volunteer and my wanting to be a volunteer. And so this is my my passion is education. So I don't think that would be a problem. And my kids are older now, that's one reason why I'm throwing my hat in at this point rather than when they were six years old <laughs> or eight years old. Perfect. So. And just a general question of, of what is your, what do you hope to accomplish in that short time if you were elected to the Board of Education? Um, I hope to just be a really strong advocate for parents and students and teachers. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Natalie and I ha was appointed to this commission by Casa de Maryland's nonprofit for immigrant advocacy. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned here the achievement gap for African American and Hispanic students. Um, but I wanted to ask you a bit of a different question. For those students that are come from immigrant backgrounds or Latino Hispanic um, and they are meeting these achievement goals um, and they're trying to apply to college but they get faced with being first time immigrant students their parents can't guide them mm -hmm. and unfortunately in our schools, the guidance counselors and the educators don't have the knowledge to guide them either. So I'd like to know what you would propose uh, to fix that situation. We've actually been talking about it at Annapolis High School in particular because we do have such a high population of Hispanic speaking parents. Um, and one thought is to um, form a, a group that would um, help the students to complete their applications. And, um, I, and also, um, as an example, at our PTA meetings, we. Um, always have interpreters available um, because I do think it's really important that the teachers, I mean, sorry, that the parents are fully aware of the process of what's going on. Um, we've actually talked about having uh, parents um, come in and help them fill out their FAFSA forms also for financial aid um, so that uh, they do have the, um, the help necessary. Great, thank you so much. And as a quick follow-up to that, um, do you think and would you advocate for some type of training for our guidance counselors and our educators, um, for our immigrant students, specifically those who may have parents who don't necessarily have all the documentation for FAFSA? Uh, you, if the guidance counselors have training in, on the FAFSA, is that what you're asking or just in general? With the training with how to deal with a particular niche of our students, the, the, the ones that maybe yeah, have and parents Yeah, I think I know in, our, in the city schools, a lot of them do have that training already. They're very well versed in that. And But I do think that overall we could, um, they, I think it would be really good to continue with them having extra training and understanding of the different, the cultural diversity that they're dealing with. Thank you so much. 
Hi, my name is Josie Urea, and I represent the Chesapeake Regional Association of Student Councils. And I have a two-part question. My first part is, what unique perspective do you bring that would especially appeal to students? And my second part is, um, in being a board member and making your decisions, how would you ensure that you would um, get the correct student voice um, opinion from Hispanic and African American students? Um, so you, you asked what would I bring? To a unique perspective that you bring that appeals to students. Um, well, I, I have um, I have two teenagers, so I'm very familiar with teenage mm -hmm. behavior. <laughs> um, so I think I, um, I'm pretty good at um, understanding their needs and wants. Um, I also, as you know, have a background with working with exchange students, so I um, have a familiarity in um, understanding um, just in general um, teenagers and um, and, I, and also, the, I also understand very clearly cultural diversity because I work with um, we work with students from sixty different um, countries. So um, I think that that gives me a unique perspective on things. And then my second part was, how would you uh, make sure that in your decisions as a board member, you would include the Hispanic and African American student voice? Um, I think again that if I, that it's important to. Um, to advocate with each school and make certain that um, it would be nice to have um, members report back from different communities um, to the board members or to a committee member with their opinions on specific topics and such so okay. that we have that information. Okay, thank you. And I like your background in advocating already to the Board of Education. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good evening. My name is Allison Pickard and I'm the um, representing the County Council of PTAs here tonight. So first and foremost, thank you so much for all your service in PTA with all your kids' schools. Um, and my question, since we've already asked, you've already stated a lot of things that would be on my list. Um, um, how do you feel about, are, are you familiar with the charter schools in our school system? and? the larger national debate surrounding charter schools and what direction do you think AACPS should be taking in with charter schools? Yeah, I'm somewhat familiar. Um, and I know there's um, some controversy over them. I know in you know, the DC school system, some have worked, some haven't. Um, I think if we have them, it's just important to um, closely monitor the progress there. Um, the, uh, the gain should outweigh the costs of such programs, I think. You know, I just think it's like all our school system, all of all our schools, we have to make sure that they're progressing well, but in particular the charter schools because they do have a little bit more autonomy, so to speak. Um, and um, I'm not I'm not against them per se, no. I think you just have to closely monitor their progress. Thank you. Miss mm. Petrus, I'm Jerry Klasmeyer. I'm here from the Anne Arundel County Community College Board of Trustees. The only question I have pertains to a comment that you made in your submission where you indicated that when you moved to Annapolis, the common question during my children's elementary school years was, what private middle school are you sending your kids to? And you suggest at the time there was a lot of mistrust of the school system. Mm -hmm. As your presence in the county has continued, has that attitude evolved into something different? I absolutely can say yes. Um, I feel like um, it, we have brought the trust back of a lot of the parents in the city of Annapolis, especially um, to see that the school systems are very high functioning and that their kids can do very well on them. And um, I, I personally have advocated amongst many parents that I know to bring their kids and give it a try. It doesn't work for everyone, but um, I absolutely believe it's improved 110% since I moved here. Good evening, I'm Dr. Linda Ferrara and I represent the Association of Educational Leaders, the administration of uh, Anne Arundel County. Uh, I have a three-part question. Define consensus, how do you build it, and then give specific examples of how you were able to do this. So consensus is um, basically an overall agreement of um, how something is working or should work. Um, and uh, I, my most recent experience would be working on the um, redistricting committee. Um, that took a lot of um, discussion. You have to discuss uh, 
we have to discuss all the possible solutions, all the possible outcomes, um, pros and cons of them. And um, once you have that discussion um, put on the table, then you have to bring them into one cohesive understanding of what of those suggestions will work best. And that group needs to come to a consensus in order to move forward with the solution. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Penny Cantwell, and I'm here representing the West, um, almost said West County, uh, <laughs> Central Maryland Chamber of Commerce. Um, so if you could please share with us uh, your vision or a description of what a successful student would look like in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. I think a successful student is one that has um, taken advantage of the many opportunities that are offered to them in the school system. Um, I think there are so many things that they, clubs and activities and um, educational opportunities they can join into. It's a matter of them, they, it's very important for them to take advantage of them um, and to move forward. And um, as they progress, um, they may or may not be going to college, but that they have some sort of um, um, understanding of what they're moving forward to in their next phase of life. Hi, I'm Emily Brandenburg from the uh, County Executive's Office, one of his appointees. Um, there's a significant and strong correlation between um, highly functioning boards and uh, the success of a school district. Mm -hmm. And um, wanted to get your perspective or your ideas of one, roles and responsibilities of a board member, and then the relationship between the board and the superintendent, how you envision that. Right, so I think that um, as a board member, um, it's important to um, listen and um, listen to your constituents, understand what they're they're looking for and asking for, and um, and then to discuss with your your fellow members um, their opinion on on these topics, um, and to look at data, see what what's worked in the in um, in other possible districts from just around the country or something like you know. Um, and to, um, and uh, you know, as we talked about, come to a consensus, but also, as I said, if you're gonna go move forward with some sort of program, it, the benefits need to outweigh the cost. So we have to look at that also, because there is fiscal responsibility involved. Um, and I think um, it's important to have an understanding of the direction that the superintendent's going to, and sometimes you might bump heads, but I think it's important to try to work together and not waste time on solutions that aren't going to work for both parties. Good evening, Heidi. Hi. Ginger Vance, um, I was appointed to this commission by the Anne Arundel County, um, the Anne Arundel Chamber of Commerce. And um, as you know, uh, we've been through Annapolis High years of getting our kids through those years, and I have no doubt that she would be able to make every meeting because uh, I never did not see her at a principal's <laughs> coffee or a, uh, a PTA meeting, but um, it was interesting as we went through those years to see those principal coffees grow, and we always wondered how could we make them grow uh, with uh, more diverse populations. And we did have Spanish um, translators in our PTO meetings, and I, I absolutely will admit that there were times I was in the wrong desk and yeah. couldn't hear what was going on because Right. They w didn't have headsets. Yep. So uh, there are challenges even with trying to accommodate the programs to allow every parent to hear that. Um, can you think of anything else that can be done to increase those populations? Because they weren't where we wanted them to be. Right. You still have a child there, um, you know, that, that might be able to really make us go from that room into the auditorium. Yeah, it's a huge challenge because we don't even get a lot of the regular, you know, non-Hispanic or whatever parents, and um, it's getting them involved. I mean, it's a it's a curious thing getting volunteers to vol people to volunteer, um, and I think um, one thing that works that I know from my own experience working with volunteers in my businesses is that um, if you f can form um, like a parental group, maybe even have um, you don't want to separate, you want them together, but to make sure that um, that they're understanding, that they don't feel left out, that they understand that there's um, the, these coffees and these meetings are going on, and to maybe, I think we, Principal Chittam even started um, making phone calls in Spanish, 
and because not everyone has a computer, that's the thing, it's assumed everyone has a computer, a lot of people don't have computers. <laughs> um, and so I think the phone calls, just the constant, you know, to keep pushing and trying to, um, you know, to send invitations home, and to even, um, you know, to personally pick up the phone and call and say, have them ask, would you like to come in and sit in these meetings? You know, we would like to hear your opinion on things. It, it is a, it's a, it's diff it's a difficult challenge, and I, I agree with that. I'd like to see. Well, I, yeah. It doesn't surprise me that your civic organization asked you to uh, take on that role in your latest venture, and uh, perhaps there is room for, um, uh, you know, um, one of the commissioners uh, speaks about the Hispanic population being intimidated mm -hmm. and often alone, and it appears that there's a lot of opportunity to let some of those people who might be scared know that much of their community may be interested in having them step up mm -hmm. and how, how, do, how do we let them know that that it's okay and it's not a question but it just seems like yeah. you are setting the stage for people that might right be might be on the cusp and need that extra push thank you thank you good evening I'm Susanna Kipke I'm uh, also an appointee of the county executive and I was going to ask you about the achievement gap but you've already talked very intelligently and thoroughly about that so yeah poor Susanna I know <laughs> my questions always get asked but it's it's a good problem um, so I'm the last one to go so that concludes your interview and as I mentioned before if you have anything that you feel like you got cut off or anything left unsaid or you think of later you're welcome to send in okay. additional comments yeah. thank you very much thank you very much next we have Colin Reinhardt Good evening. Hi, good evening. As you know, you have three minutes for an opening statement. I'm sorry, I just cut off your beginning of your opening <laughs> statement to tell you that. <laughs> when, when you have 30 seconds left of your three minutes, the yellow light will turn on. When your time is up, the red light will turn on and um, a tone will sound. And each commissioner will also have three minutes to ask and have questions answered of you. So you may begin whenever you're ready. All right. So good evening. Uh, my name is Colin Reinhardt, and I'd like to thank each of you for your consideration for the position of at-large member of the Board of Education of Anne Arundel County. Our family moved to Anne Arundel County because of the school system and the proximity to so many high-tech employers. We chose Linthicum because of the hometown feel and middle and high schools that reflect our region's changing demographics. This is the world our children will need to learn to navigate, and there is nowhere else in this county we would rather call home. This last year was a challenging one. Yes, our family opened a new and successful community bakery, and I would have brought samples, but we sold out today. But the bigger challenge is stepping away from the teachers and students I admire so much. Teaching in the North County Cluster is not a walk in the park. Yes, we celebrate the success of STEM and performing arts, but we must also celebrate the daily victories of a student coming to class for an entire week, a parent getting the time off from two jobs to chaperone a field trip, or a teacher pushing themselves and following through on a challenging SLO in an inclusion biology class where a third of the students are not native English speakers. If appointed as an at-large member, I'll bring my background as a teacher, department chair, curriculum and assessment writer, and instructional coach to the table. My varied school assignments have taken me from Southern to Brooklyn Park, Broadneck to MacArthur. I know this county, these teachers, these students. I believe they can accomplish anything with effective effort, and I would never give up on them. I am passionate that all students be given opportunities to find success in their daily education. If appointed, I will encourage fellow members of the board to explore options for bringing more vocational programs into the schools through public-private partnerships. I will encourage fellow members to examine school schedules and identify options for reaching all students through performing and fine arts. Educators are called to grow compassionate, reflective, and resourceful global citizens to enter a future we can't even imagine. Thank you for your service tonight and your consideration. Welcome, Mr. Reinhardt. Thank you. 
I'm Bill Jones. I'm the Teachers Association of Anne Arundel County appointee to this commission. Yes, sir. It's likely you already knew that. <laughs> yes, we've met several times. Thank you. And uh, I read through your submission. It's impressive that you've been a very successful educator, not only in two counties, but in two large urban counties. And now you're on your way to being a successful businessman. From what I've read, I don't know if you're going to be the appointee or not. We have to appoint one out of 23 candidates, but you have to be recognized as a strong candidate, at least in this commissioner's eyes. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. You're welcome. The one question I have is that you're the owner of a new business at yes, a time sir. when attendance to that business is still very much a priority. In light of that, and knowing that being on the school board is more than just a two-month or a two-meeting per month uh, burden would you be able to accommodate the time requirements for not only the meetings but the preparation for those meetings yes we have incredible employees at Paradise Donuts and we've entrusted our basically our life savings to these to these employees and the good news is that we do all of our baking overnight so as long as you're not meeting between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. <laughs> uh, we'll be able to make that time I think the board will probably accommodate that <laughs> thank you sir thank you very much No problem. Good evening. I'm Mariko Bennett, and I'm representing the NAACP uh, this evening. And so uh, my questions are around diversity and inclusion. Um, and, and actually, before I go in, I see you left the, the you know classroom, started your own business, but yet you're back in. And so I think that speaks to your passion for children and education. And so I think that's just is absolutely wonderful um, to serve in that way. Um, okay, so. I'm going to ask you, um, because you talked about in your application um, recruiting and uh, quality teachers, and so um, what initiatives would you bring to the county to ensure that we're identifying, recruiting, and retaining educators of color? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we have to recognize that increasing diversity in our teaching staff and our administrative staff uh, cannot be accomplished on a diversity weekend. Uh, it cannot be uh, accomplished in a in a, a month. Uh, we need a full court press as a district uh, to reach out uh, to uh, what I believe would be the, the new teachers and that's where we're going to grab them. Uh, we need to actively enlist uh, our local HBCUs to create uh, relationships with those teacher training programs so that we are bringing student teachers uh, from those schools uh, into Anne Arundel so that their first thought of where am I going to apply when I graduate is going to be well Anne Arundel I know those students I know those teachers I know those buildings uh, in, in addition to uh, reaching out to our HBCUs uh, we also have to look at how we can recruit currently active teachers, highly qualified, certified teachers uh, from other districts. Uh, we do have neighboring districts with very diverse teaching staffs, and we have to see uh, how can we entice, what are we offering here in our district. Uh, one of those is by creating leadership cohorts uh, for teachers of color uh, so that we can continue to build their leadership and uh, move them up the chain of command uh, in our district uh, to continue to bolster that. Uh, I would believe that uh, if surrounding districts see that that we're putting the money where our, uh, we're putting the money where our, where our words are, and that we actually believe in diversity and growing candidates, uh, then uh, we're going to draw them. Now, the, the final piece of that, uh, the final piece of that, is looking at the penalty steps that transfers from other districts uh, suffer when they come to Anne Arundel. Uh, currently, in the contract, uh, there is a just a one-year uh, penalty for those coming in, but moving from one of our neighboring districts to our district is already a pay loss, and that additional step uh, can be the, the final straw that might prevent a highly qualified teacher uh, from coming to our district. Thank you. And I'm sad about the donuts. <laughs> I hope there's a next time. Good evening. My name is Leanne Cremona, and I represent the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, as a teacher, what did you find were the greatest obstacles for students with learning differences, and what can the district do about them? Mm. We only have three minutes. 
<laughs> the, I think the biggest challenge uh, in, in my classroom was working with my co-teacher to find enough time for us to create valuable, meaningful plans for every child in our classroom. Our co-teachers uh, were not only in the classroom four or five periods a day, uh, but were also uh, performing testing duties. Uh, we're also working on IEPs, meeting with parents, meeting with administrators, guidance counselors, and uh, on top of that, they were coaches uh, and, and had, had personal lives. Imagine that. So it was, it was extremely challenging for the special educators to be able to carve out during the day that time to meet with me or in some cases the three other teachers with whom they were teaching. So we need to focus on what are we doing uh, with scheduling for our special educators? What are we doing to train up special educators in, in particular needs, specifically mathematics or science, so that we can have devoted special educators who follow their children uh, throughout, throughout their career uh, at a given school? Uh, I know in, in some buildings, uh, there's a constant rotation of which students are on a caseload. Uh, I believe that yet you you own those kids when they enter in the freshman year. You need to follow them, or whether or sixth grade or kindergarten, and you follow those children throughout so that you build those relationships with the kids, with the teachers, and with the parents. And if you're focused in a particular subject area, your subject knowledge is going to be that much greater and be able to support those students that much more. So that's that's. I think one way one way we can we can start to uh, start to attack that problem, but certainly uh, the, the planning time that's available with co-teachers. Absolutely, more staff would help as well. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. Good evening. I'm Estefania Holler, and I represent the County Council PTA. My question is: What are your thoughts on parent community involvement in the decision-making process of the school system, and how would you work to increase? or encourage this input if attending, if appointed to this vacancy? So without parents, we wouldn't have students. So uh, beginning with that, uh, the, the parent voice is incredibly powerful. Uh, I don't know that our, our parents in the county realize how much say and how much sway that our PTAs have in individual schools. Uh, as, a, as a, a member of the board, uh, I'm not sure uh, what sort of lobbying efforts we would be able to do to encourage parents to take, to take um, more, uh, a more active or activist role uh, for, within their schools. Um, but as, as, a, as an individual uh, in the North County area, uh, I would certainly make myself available uh, to, to speak with parents, to uh, attend PTA meetings and also to be in schools on those particular days when parents are there. For example, uh, Columbus Day uh, when parents are there. It's important for the for a member of the board to be present, to have discussions uh, with, with the parents in the environment in which their kids are learning. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Natalie and I am appointed to the commission by Casa Maryland. Um, which is a big immigrant advocacy group and coming from Montgomery County teaching them. I'm sure you've heard of them. Yes, ma'am. Um, I find it actually very interesting that you taught in Montgomery County schools and then moved to Anne Arundel. And the reason being Montgomery County is ideal when it comes to their educators and their counselors really knowing how to handle the specific needs and issues that face immigrant students and immigrant parents. Unfortunately, in Anne Arundel, we don't have as much of that knowledge. Um, and I do believe it, it needs to get better because we do have an influx uh, in our population with immigrant students and Spanish-speaking community. So I would like to know what would you propose that we do in our schools in order to better help and guide these students um, with their specific problems and their specific issues that they face? So I'd like to begin uh, my response with uh, a story uh, from last year. At, at North County, we had uh, two new students uh, in my inclusion algebra class uh, that had arrived from El Salvador. And the two students were struggling mightily in class. 
Uh, there was another young man who was doing his best to translate, but when you're learning all that new math vocabulary, uh, you, you don't even know the words. We, we worked very hard to, to keep the students in our class. We did everything we could, um, and at, at some point, uh, the students requested a transfer to the ESOL math class. Uh, it wasn't until several weeks later that we learned that one of these students had been out of school for 18 months uh, and could barely do arithmetic, while the other student was capable of doing Algebra 2. But on the surface, we had no way of knowing that. Uh, one, of the, one of the solutions, I think that's a common sense solution, is getting bilingual paraeducators into the classrooms uh, that can support uh, specific content areas, uh, be it social studies, science, math. Uh, that's, that's one place we can begin. Uh, I, I bring that up specifically because on uh, a teacher exchange that we conducted with Annapolis High School, where teachers from uh, North County and, uh, and Glen Burnie and Annapolis, we, we visited each other's schools, that we saw how powerful a bilingual paraeducator can be in a math class. Uh, I would start there. Uh, the second piece is by involving parents more uh, into schools. Uh, one of the extremely successful programs that we had uh, while I was at Einstein, which is in the Kensington Wheaton area, uh, was we had a third party liaison that uh, had a little trailer on campus and several times a week uh, she would be in there and it created a, uh, an environment where parents wouldn't have to be afraid of, of the government or of the school system and we could communicate through that third party uh, to uh, help their child uh, reach success in a, in, a, in a strange environment. Yeah. Thank you so much for your answers. Hi. Hello. Uh, students definitely like baked goods, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> yeah, the bribes, right? <laughs> um, so my question is two parts. Sure. <laughs> so my first part is, um, you say in your application you want to try to make fine arts uh, another special uh, schedule class. Yes. Um, so how would making that fine arts class um, negatively affect students' opportunities to more STEM, um, STEM or English classes or classes like that? And then my second question is, um, so you do again mention bolstering vocational programs in every school, including secondary schools. Yes. So how would you find the funding to update those facilities in those schools? Ah, uh, funding. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the fine arts. Okay. Uh, uh, fine arts performing arts uh, is I extremely valuable uh, because we're we're teaching humans, we're teaching people who have passions, uh, and by just focusing on core subjects and by uh, stripping away their opportunities. To, to do uh, the things that really enrich our lives uh, and make us who we are, uh, I think is a severe detriment uh, to our students, especially as they're getting older. You know, for many kids, that's the reason they come to school. There's plenty of research out there that shows how the arts improves test scores in our core subjects. So I don't necessarily view the fine arts as taking away from STEM. Uh, I hear your question as an issue of, of scheduling, which is perhaps more of a logistical question. Uh, one uh, possible suggestion is to create skinnies. If, I don't know if, you're, if you have skinnies at, at, at Severna Park. With, with the, the skinny schedule, you take one of the regular 90-minute blocks and you split it in half, creating two 40-minute periods so that you can, um, I know a lot of the STEM programs use it in order to get the accelerated coursework done, so you have that 40 minutes every day for two different courses. So you can also bring that in. Um, you can certainly have a band rehearsal in 40 minutes. You can certainly uh, work on an art project for 40 minutes, practice a dance for 40 minutes, work in drama for 40 minutes. So there are those opportunities. And if you're, if you're giving kids that reason to come to school every day, even though they're struggling in their other core classes, they can look forward to that because that's, that's their time to shine. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the moment during the day when they can be people, creative people. Uh, now, your, your second question, uh, if, if you wouldn't mind reminding me. No, of course not. Um, so you mentioned bolstering vocational programs, and yes. especially secondary schools. So how would you find funding to update those facilities to support those? Right, so specifically, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of, of bringing in uh, say an automotive class, automotive one, two, three, bring in a culinary class in, into, into the schools. Uh, so I think that for the most part the facilities are there and there, there are uh, local businesses, car dealers, uh, mechanics, local restaurateurs um, that would be able to provide 
uh, a lot of the uh, the support in terms of uh, in terms of an instruction uh, mm -hmm. that we would uh, we would be able to yeah. okay thank you that's okay I understand what you said yep. good evening my name is Allison Pickard and I'm with the County Council of PTAs so first I want to thank you for coming out I know um, with a new business um, this is um, a little extra something but we have not had a board member from North County in over 10 years yeah. and many of our most vulnerable students are in that area so the fact that you not only live there but have started a business there and have taught there is I think in my mind makes you a very strong candidate thank you with that I have a question um, and I left my glasses at home, so. Um, um, how do you envision incorporating public advocacy and community leadership into your service, if appointed to the board? Mm. With so many years uh, without the North County having a voice uh, on the board, uh, there is a lot of, uh, I don't want to say pent up, uh, but a lot of concerns uh, about the, about the the direction that uh, that we're we're headed with focusing on on test scores with focusing on uh, what many in our community may feel take take away from the uh, just the act of the act of living the being able to uh, be successful in a career uh, many many in our community. Uh, are going to struggle in, in order to afford college and take on that debt. Uh, not all of our students are going to be successful in a, in a traditional sense uh, that we're used to. Now that doesn't mean that we need to take away the opportunities for those children who at some time may decide to pursue college, um, but it's important uh, as a member from that area. Now I, I recognize I'm an, I, if, if selected I would be an at-large member so I would be responsible for representing everyone uh, within the district and all those different constituencies. Uh, but with North County having a, a special place in my heart, uh, it would it, it would behoove me to uh, to certainly bring all those concerns to the fore. Um, public advocacy is is challenging when you're one one of an eight member board, and you do after decisions made need to present a united front. We all agree with this decision. Uh, so my role as a public advocate would, would have to occur in our initial discussions uh, when we're gaining consensus and when we're sharing our, our personal stories that we bring from our communities. Uh, and I will make every attempt and every opportunity. And every time uh, someone from our area comes into the shop, they're going to be able to share, uh, share their stories and their concerns with us. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Reinhardt, I'm Jerry Klasmar from the Anne Arundel County Board of uh, Trustees for Anne Arundel County Community College. Um, your application represents a very perplexing problem for me. Your, your resume, your experience, and your, your performance tonight suggest you are an educational rock star, and I'm wondering why you still are not in the classroom. Can you explain how you migrated from what is a very apparently successful career as a teacher to working in a bakery? It's right. well owning and it means working in one, <laughs> right? And 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 keeping my figure. So uh -huh. the th there's not a day that goes by that I don't second guess myself. Um, my wife is watching right now, and I'm sure she's cringing. So, we I didn't mean to get you in trouble with oh, that question. No, I, I, I just I, have an honest answer. I, I do it myself. So, starting in Montgomery County, uh, and then working at the boards, uh, both in Montgomery and here in Anne Arundel, uh, and then returning to the classroom. Uh, I, I returned to the classroom because, as a, as a math coach and as a resource teacher of the board, uh, I visited so many schools, and was having the opportunities to see teachers doing exciting things in their classroom, use that curriculum that I wrote, and, and come up with a new twist that I hadn't thought of, and that, that excitement just bubbled up. 
And when the when the opportunity when that opening came at North County uh, to to go there, uh, I I had to jump at it. I, I had I had to take that on uh, and give give someone else from the district an opportunity to to learn the curriculum side of things a, as well. Uh, to, to answer your question, uh, why did I choose to leave? Um, we it had always been part of our, our family's life plan to open a small business. And when that, again, when that opportunity just suddenly appeared, and, and quite literally, I got the phone call from uh, the landlord of a, of a local strip center who, who knew a little bit about our baking history and, and called while I was in the tunnel to go out to graduation uh, for, for North County. And I get the call, and he says, do you want to do this? You know, it's, it's, it's a very popular space, and do you want to do this? Uh, again, uh, I'm a risk taker. <laughs> And 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 a, and a consummate, uh, a consummate person who wants to keep on learning. I just had to try that new experience, and we are not s stepping away from education. Uh, we're actively promoting music and arts in our community, hosting those uh, events in our shop, um, and now that there's an opportunity to, to serve as a as a different stakeholder to complete that circle of parent, teacher, curriculum writer, and then uh, potentially as a board member. Um, that, to me, satisfies the service that, that really uh, was the, the emphasis of when I began my career uh, 13 years ago. Good answer. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good evening. Hi. Um, I'm Dr. Linda Ferrara. I represent the Association of Educational Leaders, the administration in Anne Arundel County. But before I give you my question, I have to ask, have you read the book Horace's Compromise by Ted Sizer? No, ma'am, I haven't had the opportunity. I think that you would probably enjoy that. Okay. Uh huh. It's a trilogy. Oh, even better. T to go with your three part question? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. However, I do have a three part question. Okay. Uh, define consensus, how do you build it, and then give an example of how you were able to do this. So consensus is, is taking a, 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 a group of folks, albeit two or a hundred, and having them uh, find a common understanding and, uh, and to agree on a course to take. Um, you build that through uh, identifying requirements, uh, determining what that objective is uh, that you're trying to reach, how, uh, what, what are what are concrete steps in order to get there, and then really the consensus comes from from fleshing out uh, th those pieces that that everyone can agree on. So we can agree what the objective is. Uh, we can ag agree um, that one, two, and three must happen. Now, how do we do that? And that's where the, the rich discussion happens, uh, where we really show respect to, e to each other and each other's ideas and, and really put our listening ears on. Uh, sorry, the teacher came out. Uh, in, in, order to, uh, in order to come to that solution. Uh, now, an example of that uh, was I worked in the curriculum office as a math content specialist in Montgomery County. And I was tasked with creating a scope and sequence for uh, seventh grade mathematics. Uh, this was at the same time uh, that Montgomery County was rolling out the integrated elementary curriculum, if you're familiar with that. So we were going to have students graduating from that program coming into seventh grade. Now we could do business as usual and look at the Common Core and, and just you know pick a book and, and there we go, we can have that. Uh, but I, I'm a risk taker and so we decided uh, as, a, as a team to take the approach of creating an integrated seventh grade mathematics course. Uh, we built that consensus by meeting with all of the curriculum writers from across all of the content areas to find highly engaging concepts from each of their courses, seeing how they matched up with Common Core standards, and then create uh, a course that would make sense to students and to teachers instructionally that would bring other courses into mathematics Instead of what we often see is, can you teach this token concept in, in history today? We would be bringing that in to, to show how, how it fit. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Penny Cantwell, and I'm representing the Central Maryland Chamber. Two questions. First, are you where Keller's was? Yay! All right. We're, we're, okay. two, we're two doors down, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> donut. Thank you. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. Question p or request. Please share your vision or description of what a successful student in Anne Arundel County Public Schools would look like. So I have a two-part answer uh, because of the, the, the two very distinct uh, viewpoints. So as a parent, uh, I'm, I'm looking for my children who are students in the system at, at Lenthicum Elementary. Uh, I'm looking for my students to grow, to be compassionate, to be open-minded, and to be resourceful so that when they get out into that world, they can solve their own problems. And if they can't solve their own problems, they're open-minded enough to listen to other solutions uh, and to work through that. Now, granted, they're, they're seven and eight right now, so that we're working on open-mindedness and, and seeking help. Uh, but I, th these are soft skills, and I just, I just want them to be happy and successful and be able to take care of themselves and not live in my basement. I mean, that, that's, that's my goal. Now, as a professional educator, where that, where that, that t sentence to butt heads is often, as a professional educator, success is already defined for you. Your students must meet this threshold. You must get such a percent on your SLO. You must, uh, are you familiar with SLO, student learning? Okay, <laughs> let's make sure. Uh, and with the with with these measures of success already set often those those other soft skills are are lost because of this focus students are doing well enough let's pull them out of their fine art and tack on an additional help session uh, an additional period uh, during second semester so we can bolster their scores well you've just robbed students of possibly the reason they're really coming to school they're already struggling in traditional instruction, and we're going to double them up. So when we look at uh, when when we, we look at how we're defining success in education, there are opportunities, and the standards for mathematical practice certainly spells this out with uh, with students becoming effective communicators of mathematics. That we can teach that because the the park expects them to be excellent communicators, to be open minded, to be resourceful, to be problem solvers. Uh, whether that's a mathematics park or science or English, uh, we can still teach that and we can get there, uh, but we can't get, we can't continue to get buried by legislated expectations of what success means. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emily Brandenburg. I'm a county executive appointee. Hi. And <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you for um, coming out and thank you for your application. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, charter schools and where you're at and what you think about them? And sure. Are you familiar with the ones in the county? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so I, I had the opportunity to do some work at Chesapeake Science Point uh, in my work at the board. Uh, I'm also uh, familiar with Monarch Academy. Uh, several members of our community uh, have students there and, and can't say enough about just the wonderful vibes that they get in that building. Um, I hope that the Monarch Academy that that's plan for Annapolis has the same level of success that the Glen Burnie does. Uh, I thoroughly believe that the charter schools uh, play a vital role. They, they, they certainly fill a niche uh, in our district. Um, I have I have uh, peers in Pennsylvania that that are also exploring cyber charters. So online charters is fascinating to me uh, what that might look like. So there, there's there's certainly places for that and there's certainly a need for that. Um, what I ask all of my all, all of our friends and our neighbors who have kids and they've elected to go to a charter school is why. And they can tell me all the great things that are happening happening at Monarch and these and these incredible landmark lessons that the kids look forward to each year, and that and that's incredible and provides a great amount of motivation. Uh, but uh, what these folks struggle to articulate is what was it about the home school? that made them think, you know, maybe, maybe charter is right for me. It, it wasn't, I'm going to charter for charter's sake. There was something there that set that. We don't necessarily have in our district a, a program or a plan to, uh, 
I guess for lack of a better term, could do an exit interview with parents who choose a non-traditional option, whether that's charter or whether that's homeschool or whether that's uh, enrolling in a parochial school. Why are parents leaving their homeschools, leaving our districts? Because they're still paying taxes on the schools that now their children are not enrolled. So they're, they're, something must be there. Now I know for many it's, it's a, it's a faith-based decision, it's a personal decision, there's a disagreement with curriculum, but, but let's look deeper. What else is going on? Is, are they, are they uh, worried about the safety of their child? Are they worried about how diverse their building might be or the special education services their kids are gonna receive at that particular school? What is going on? And when we start to dig deeper into uh, determining the root cause of why families leave the district, I think that's going to really set us up for creating uh, in, in the next decade as we put together that next master plan of what we can do to meet the needs of all our families in the district. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Susanna Kipke. I'm also an appointee of the county executive. And um, my, my husband went to elementary and middle school in North County. So Great. he's very familiar with, with what what was going on in North County schools, I guess, a while ago. But in any case, my question is, um, given that you have taught in North County, you live in North County, do you think that the interests and needs of those schools are currently being met? And if not, what would you do as a member of the board to mm. help get those needs and interests met? That's, I have to remind myself that if appointed, I would serve as an at-large member and the needs in, in, the, in North County and District 1 are unique and are not going to be the same needs that, that our friends down in Southern have. You know, we're, we're dealing with very different issues. Um, many of the same issues, but you know, different ones as well. Uh, so the, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, the advocacy for North County, uh, that would have to come in our discussions. Uh, as we're coming to consensus as a board, uh, but once once the decision is made, uh, I, uh, of course, I would I would communicate that to my constituents and see how can we work within those confines in, in our district to meet the needs of our uh, in our in our cluster to, to meet to meet those uh, the needs of those students. Uh, I didn't ignore your question. Uh, I know you're. Uh, are we currently meeting the needs? There. We need advocates. We need more Right Start advisors. We need paraeducators who are bilingual. We need more community ambassadors. We need our children in that part of the county to see a teaching staff that reflects what our community looks like. But that's not just North County. That's, that's Old Mill. That's Glen Burnie. That's Annapolis. And soon it's going to be every school in the district. That, that's going to need that support, and it's not because you know we're not we're not meeting the safety concerns or there's there's just constant strife in the building. Our students need to talk, and we have to give them those proactive opportunities to get whatever they're feeling off their chest, whether it is uh, something that could that could lead to an altercation or it's a different kind of family problem that we don't even realize. I mean, the conflicts in every school are unique, but having all of those third parties and being able to service uh, all of our children and their mental health needs um, to avoid suspension and to, uh, and to avoid those referrals, I mean, I, I think that's, that's important. So I can certainly advocate for those from the North County perspective because they're gonna benefit every school in the district, but it costs money. <laughs> I am the last one to go. So that concludes your interview. If you think of anything you'd like to add later or you felt like anything went unsaid, you're welcome to um, submit additional comments. All right, thank you. To, mm -hmm. Thank you for have your time. A, have a good evening. Thank you very much. All right, yes, we are. We are going to take a break. We'll come back. Our next interview is scheduled at 745.
together. All right. Next, <laughs> next we have Ms. Younger. Good evening. I believe you were here when I was uh, outlining the interview procedure. Is that correct? So you've heard it before. Or well, I noticed it this last time <laughs> with the gentleman prior to me. All right. So okay. you are welcome to begin whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you. Um, for the past, well, for most of my adult life and work history, I have worked in with public from the sheriff's department to the last 15 years working with people who are chronically homeless with mental health and addictions issues. And in dealing with these people, I deal with first a melting pot of different people from different backgrounds and also their families. I have children here in Anne Arundel Public Schools, and I have a granddaughter, well, they were in Anne Arundel Public Schools, and I have a granddaughter who is currently in Anne Arundel Public Schools. But most of my experience with the school system is through my clients. I attend many meetings with teachers and principals because unfortunately a lot of my clients' children are some of your problem kids. So I get to see those who are being picked on and those who are picking on others. Those who, in spite of how their lives are at home, are still really good students, and those who are struggling to be better students. Through my history here for the last 15 years, working with children who come from special situations, a lot of times their parents keep in touch with me, and I have seen how my influence and my help and teaching them how to work with the teachers and the principals and the school system has caused these kids, many of them, believe it or not, have gone on to college or have been successful in their life doing other things. And it all comes as a base, where their foundation is, who is there to help them. And sometimes their parents are not the ones or their guardians are not the ones to give them the support they need. And as they said, most of my life, it takes a village to raise a child. And I have enjoyed being a part of that village. It is important to me that all children who attend school are happy, are scholastically happy, and are able to proceed through their journey of education in a more positive light. Let school be that place where they get good meals, where they get the support they need, and where they can become the people, because believe it or not, even the worst, be the worst behaved child in their heart of hearts really want to be a better person, and they just need someone to help them to get there. I feel as though the experiences that I've had throughout my work history can help me to be um, a good contributing person to the at-large uh, member of the school board. Sorry for the delay. I have to continue to take my glasses on and off depending on how close I want to see. That I have the same problem, no problem. <laughs> I was, I'm Bill Jones, I'm the, the appointee of the Teachers Association of Anne Arundel County. And I noticed that the second goal you listed of the three that you were supposed to present in 15 words or less mm -hmm. was to educate teachers to not be a part of the bullying problem in the school. Yes. I guess I'm going to ask a three-part question this time. Okay. One, does that mean teachers are part of the bullying problem in Not the schools? Not all, but some can be. And if that answer is yes, which it apparently is, what type of training is missing? Because they do get training. Mm -hmm. And give me an example or two without mentioning a student, teacher, or school name. Okay. Well, I'll start with the example. Okay. And the example is there are a lot of... Um, commercials that talk about bullying and how we should help children deal with it. And one of the things that are said is, if you see someone being bullied, take up for them. 
Well, sometimes when you do that, the teacher tells you to sit down and let them handle it. Well, sometimes the child being bullied is not able to handle it. Sometimes some children can't speak for themselves because they're shy or they don't like confrontation. So it's nothing wrong, I don't feel, with a child feeling confident with the backing of their teacher to say, hey, you need to leave Sally alone. Sally, not the real name. Um, and not the teacher then saying some kind of smart whip that makes that child feel bad. Um, I think one of the problems that we have today in general, and not just with children, is that the bullying situation is not just in school, it's also in the workplace, it's also sometimes in social situations. So again, going back to the school system is the foundation of most children and their growth, that if they learn how to deal with these situations at school, they'll be able to handle them later in their lives. The, um, what I believe is, and the best type of workshops that I like to facilitate are the ones where you're playing a role. And I believe that if a teacher is in their little workshops that they have on Thursdays and Fridays, which I never can understand why, sometimes we have them on both those days, it makes babysitting hard to find. However, um, if we had workshop where there were role playing and they could feel how that, or remember how that feels, maybe that'll make them a little bit more sensitive to how a child feels when they're being bullied or when they're even speaking up for a friend or even another child that they don't know, but they see it. I just feel as though that that makes, um, it helps children to learn when they don't feel as though that they're being picked on. I gather you're familiar with restorative practices? Maybe not in those words. Sorry. Well, it's similar to what you're talking about. Okay, thank you. Good evening. I'm Mariko Bennett, and I'm representing the NAACP uh, this evening. Um, I want to first start off with saying thank you for the work that you do. Um, you know, far often, I think the least and the last um, are often forgotten. And so to put in the work with the most vulnerable uh, populations is something to definitely be commended. So thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you a question in regards to suspension in the school and, how, and school to prison pipeline and how it contributes to the industrial uh, complex. So studies show that African American boys and girls are suspended at higher rates than that of their white counterparts, uh, which contributes to the school to prison pipeline. What would you do to combat, combat excuse me, the school to prison pipeline? Well. Understanding that it seems as though that the African American children are being suspended more. One of the things that I have noticed in my line of work is you have to listen and you have to pay attention and not go into a situation where you already have a preconceived notion about a person. And a lot of times we do that. So one of the things that we need to do is find out really why are these children being suspended more? Um, what what reasoning is there if you were asked why are these children being suspended what would the reasons be and if the reasoning that you see is no different than maybe a problem that you have with other children then we might have to turn the idea out into the people who are making these decisions and help them to see and clear because you know a lot of times people don't realize that they're doing things like this they don't realize that they're picking on one group of per people. And they may say, um, not being negative, it's, it's not a race thing. But a lot of times it is, and you don't realize it. So again, that goes back to um, training people and training administration and training the teachers to, to see how you are gearing all these children up one main place of being suspended all the time and you're not looking at the whole picture and you're not looking at the other children. I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank okay. you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Leanne Carmona and I'm with the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, you spoke a lot about behavior in your opening. You spoke about suspension. I'm, I'm curious since you said you do attend meetings for these kids, um, have you seen 
positive or um, what types of positive strategies have you seen for working with children with challenging behavior? Have, have you seen well, anything that you've liked that is working? It or? all kind of depends on the person who's in front of me. One of the things that I've noticed and many of my clients have noticed over the years is as soon as I walk in with them, that the whole attitude of the people that they've dealt with before is different. And this is even, this is as much as um, especially foreign um, people who come into our country have a heavy accent. Many times, unfortunately, the teachers or administration treat them a certain kind of way. And sometimes when teachers know that a person's been homeless, they treat them a certain kind of way. And when I walk in with them and they know they have someone representing them, right away they get a different, um, how did I say, they get treated differently. I guess that's the best way I can put it. And then from there, I come in and I say, again, in listening, what seems to be the problem? What are the problems that you're having in, with this person? And then I turn it right back on them because they're the professional. What do you feel we can do to help this child be more successful in your class? And then when you talk, and I usually have a talk, you know, with your children, you know, before you go to the mall, you talk to them and you say, don't do this, don't do that. Well, you have to do that with clients before you walk in, especially people who are bipolar or just have had a hard time with this person in, you know, history with this particular person has been hard. You have to say, you know, hold your tongue. Let's walk in. Let's take care of business. And they tend to do that. And they're motivated to do that because they want their children to have um, a good education experience. So when we do that, that was, that's the main thing. The main thing is going in with, with a positive attitude and listening and letting the people who are experienced talk to us about what all of us can do as a team to make this journey a success. Does that help? It helps. So a little bit. It helps. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hi, good evening. I'm Estefania Holler, and I represent the County Council PTA. Uh, first of all, thank you for everything you're doing. The homeless population in Anne Arundel County is something people don't realize that happens, especially in schools, and you're doing a wonderful work in helping them and being their voice. So I thank commend you. you for that. Thank you. Um, on that note, what other aspects of the school system that um, you work with that you are not really well knowledge about and how would you educate yourself in those things being that you have focused so much on one side of the well what I would do is when a situation would come up I would research it and um, research more than just one reference um, and try to find out what the problem is and how I can work to help fix it but research would be my very first thing to find out what it is that I need to address. So on that note, what aspects of the Board of Education and in the school system uh, would you start researching to be prepared if you were to be appointed to the Board of Education? Well, the whole board, I would look at, and there's a lot of information because you can read a lot of the minutes and you can um, uh, talk to different people who've had experiences with the board. So those would be the first thing. And then I would try to see what exactly it is that I need to do to make myself more of a contribution to the board. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Natalie, um, and I'm appointed to this commission by Casa de Maryland, which is an immigrant advocacy group in uh, Maryland. And I, I would like to know, based on your background of the relationships that you build with these families that you serve um, and their children in the schools, many times what we see in our county is that uh, minority groups and immigrant communities, the parents are not as involved in the education um, as, as other groups in, in, the, in the schools. So I'd like to know what kind of solution you can propose to reaching out to these parents and making sure that they maintain an active role in their students' education. Well, one of the reasons why a lot of the minority parents don't feel, um, are not as involved is because they don't feel comfortable. So 
one of the things that I would do, let's say if I had a client who said, well, I don't want to go to the PTA meetings, I don't want to do this, the first thing I would do is how about if I go with you? And then that way if we go together, I can see what issues she's having and help her to feel a little bit more comfortable. Even though we're adults, just like children, we need somebody sometime to just hold our hand to work through the uncomfortable parts. So that would be the first thing. And then I would talk to that person about what are the things that you've been uncomfortable about? Has it been a particular person? Um, and tell them and motivate them that by you participating, how this benefits your child. And so I would motivate the person to kind of work with the people who make them feel uncomfortable and then um, address the issues that they have. Because sometimes things are just simply a miscommunication and people didn't mean to make you feel that way. So my, my main thing would be to go with them to a couple meetings, um, sit through them, and see what the problem is, and talk to them about what they feel, what they perceive the problem to be, and work with the people like the administration or whatever. Hey, Sally's feeling a little uncomfortable when she comes in. What can you do to help me to help her feel more comfortable? For me, most things are working as a team, talking to people. When you talk and you listen, you find out the answers. When you assume, you have no idea. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Josie Rea, and I represent the Chesapeake Regional Association of Student Councils. I love your opening statement. It really appealed to students' perspectives, and I thank you for your work that you have already helped so many students. Um, so my question is, um, and you're addressed to question number two, um, so you talk about suicide rates and helping address academic success and safety in schools. And now many students to relieve their um, emotions on those topics go to guidance counselors and school psychiatrists. But many of those um, people are overwhelmed with over 300 plus students already. And they can't really have that, like you have, um, relationship with that student to actually help them. So how would you advocate for relieving those departments? Well. Working with nonprofits for a long time, I'm used to working in constraints, with financial constraints, where you don't have enough money to pay the people what they should earn, and also having more people to help out with a caseload. So what the, how can we, with what we already have, and this, let's say someone says you're not getting any more, um, how can we help? Would it be a motivator for me to ask uh, or to get people to stay a little longer, even though they may not get paid, maybe there's another motivator to help the guidance counselors to stay and kind of triage some of the children who have problems. The ones that have problems and have more severe problems, again, it goes back to listening and understanding and bringing in the family and help letting them help you help that child. So. You, you get a group, let's say a counselor, I don't know, maybe they might have ugh, 40, 50, 60 kids for one counselor, it even could be more. So I know that it's probably hard for the counselor to meet each child, but if the teacher lets the counselor know that this particular child is having a problem, and then you work with those children the most, then and bring their families in and maybe the families can help also because a lot of the things if you correct it in school but you're still going home with the problems the problems going right back to the same issues so maybe I guess my, what I'm trying to say is maybe through volunteers and families extending the hand of the counselor because they are so overwhelmed but the children still need that attention and a follow-up question, just real quick, is how have you helped the troubled students that you've helped um, find leadership skills in themselves? Well, you get to learn a person, and fortunately, as you say, the counselors don't get to do this, but I get to m meet the children where they are normally in their homes or wherever they're living, where it's a shelter, or if they're just um, doubling up in someone's house. And many of them, one of the things that I do is help people find housing, okay, because we're trying to end homelessness. Mm -hmm. So um, talking to them where they are, making sure that they get therapy, making sure that they get the services that they need. And then as you talk to them, you learn what their strengths are and you build up on those strengths. Thank you very much.
Good evening. My name is Allison Pickard, and I'm also with the County Council of PTAs. Thank you for um, coming out tonight and your application. Um, what prompted you to apply for the school board, particularly um, this vacancy with the short term? And what kind of impact do you think you can make in that short time period? Well, the reason why is because I'm in front of, like, I have a meeting this Monday for um, a student. And so I'm always with different students or different people in the um, system. And I start noticing some things that I feel as though that I can help with to make things a little better. Um, so I said, okay, well, I found out that we had this opening and I said, well, let me see what I can do if I can come on board. And some of the things that I can do to impact is give that other eye of um, these are some of the other issues that people may not have thought about. They, the county, believe it or not, well, of course you know, has a lot of services for children who are homeless and everything, but sometimes there's some little things that fall between the cracks. And I feel as though that I'm around enough that I can help with those. And at the other part is I feel as though because of my ability to get along with most people, even if it's something that doesn't have to do with what my experiences are, I can usually help with other things. I normally do not say take no for an answer. If something needs to be done, we can always figure it out. And I feel as though that my lack for a better term, go get it attitude and getting things done and getting people services can help everyone in the county. Thank you. And since I still have a little bit of time, <laughs> um, I'm just curious if you had the opportunity to review the board member handbook. And if so, um, what do you feel the um, time commitment is of serving on the board and does it fit with your current um, professional life and family life? Well, um, since my children are grown, that's not a problem. Um, and um, when it comes to work, we're able to flex our time. We're able to work any way we need to. Um, so those are the main things. Those are my um, things that I put most of my time in. So I have the time to put that energy and the time into um, doing it. I understand it's two meetings a month or one Wednesday during the day and one Wednesday in the evening. So that's not a problem for me at all. And all the other things and people calling you and everything throughout the week. So yeah, that wouldn't be a problem. Okay, because the, the legislation now states that board members need to, are required to meet at least 75% of meetings. Mm -hmm. And if you go and look, uh, dig a little deeper, board service does require, it is more than just two meetings a month. So okay. just be mindful of that. Yeah, that's Thank you very problem. much. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Schenger, I'm Jerry Klasmeyer, representing the uh, Anne Arundel County Community College Board of Trustees. Looking over your application, I was intrigued by the identification by you of the suicide rate of our students as the one of the most critical issues facing the school system and I was wondering if you could elaborate on your awareness of what 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 do you know about that well um, the agency that I work for Anne Arundel Mental Health Agency has a crisis response team and um, unfortunately many times they have to uh, make a call to many of the schools in that county because of the children having ideas about how they want to commit suicide and stuff. That bothers me a lot. I come from the time when it seemed like we were really happy So, <laughs> as high school students. So I, all of the things now that have progressed throughout time um, between social media and um, bullying and other problems that have made children find it hard to grow up and with mental health issues which cause children, which is a part of this, the um, problem, the symptom of suicide. Um, I feel as though that uh, that is something that people can't ignore. Parents need to be made more aware and look at certain things. Um, at one time, you know, they tried to talk about the privacy of your, your young child, but now you can't give them that privacy. You really need to know their friends. You really need to know what they're looking at on social media and the computer and the internet. And you need to be more a part of the children's lives. And once you are, maybe, and again, going back to asking questions and listening, 
you can um, set, get them services because Anne Arundel County has fabulous services for children through therapy and all other kind of things that you can help them through this hard time because it is preventable, hopefully, if they get the services that they need and the support that they need from their family and their friends. Well, thank you. We, we've had 23 applicants for this at-large position, and I think, if memory serves me correctly, you're the only one that's identified the, the suicide incidents as an issue that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm Dr. Linda Ferrara, and I'm representing the Association of Educational Leaders Administration of Anne Arundel County. I have a three-part question. Uh, how do you define consensus? Um, how do you build it? And then give an example of how you were able to do it. Okay. Well, consensus is that everyone um, agrees on a particular topic. And um, the way you build it is you have to get people to agree on that particular topic. And then once you do, then you work with, um, if there is a problem, how are we, and we agree on that one issue, then brainstorm on how we need to take care of that issue. And bringing different people together always helps. You might have a little argument about it, but it always helps to really solve a problem to get everyone to kind of see it the same way and bring their piece in to, to agree on um, what we need to do to take care of it. So for example, um, going back to bullying, um, if everyone can kind of see or saw that that was an issue, then everyone started to bring together the media and everyone else and family involvement and students and faculty and administration to see what the problem is and how we can solve it. They're working on it, but there's still some pieces there. And once we see what those pieces are that are missing, then we can work and, and have more of a healthier situation for students in school. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Penny Cantwell, and I am here representing the Central Maryland Chamber of Commerce. So I would like you to share with us your vision or a description of what a successful student in Anne Arundel County Public Schools would look like. I see a successful student as being a student that has grades that are allowing them to uh, reach the dreams and goals that they have for adulthood. So, in other words, if you have a child who is having problems in school, that those problems could be either behavioral or academically, that we address those, that they don't feel as though they're an island left out there by themselves, and that when we're working with that child to get where the goal is to be a better student, then if they decide they want to go to college, they don't have to take a lot of those courses where you don't get any credit, but your parents or your, or your um, FAFSA has to pay for it before you can get into your core classes. And so I see a student being scholastically uh, well-adjusted, a well-rounded student who has, as you talked earlier, about fine arts who also are doing well in the STEM program, who gets a taste of everything, a little sports, a little, because, um, you know, a student may decide, um, I'm good with writing, but I'm not good with math. That was me. Um, but if I believe if I had a real, a teacher who understood what my challenges were, I think I would have been a better math student. So I just feel as though that a well-rounded student is a person who can be in a successful adult, whether they decide to go on to college or they decide to get a trade, but they can make a living for themselves. I like the idea of a charter school to have that independent um, that's kind of geared toward the student. And I guess that would be a little harder in a, in, a, in a regular school where the classes are larger. However, it would be nice that if all students had that same opportunity, that 
I'm sure that there's some students who need a little bit more structure, but it would be nice that the other students who don't need that kind of structure can get that kind of independent work in a regular school setting that is not just for those kids in the charter school. You're welcome. Good evening. I'm Susanna Kipke. I'm also a county executive appointee. Um, in your application, in your in your 15 words or less list, um, you mentioned that you'd like to get more resources or more help and support for teachers in the classroom. Do you have something specific in mind? And if so, where will you find the funding for that? <laughs> funding. <laughs> I Well, when it comes to funding, I always look at fundraisers. And I know that a lot of PTAs are really good with that. There are some that aren't as good as others, and maybe they can learn from each other. The resources that I would get for the teachers are resources that um, the administration found because I think we all realize that there's some some challenges for the teachers there are some teachers who are stronger in doing some things than others so the resources would be more workshops I'm sure they would like that more workshops to help them to build on some of the skills that they have challenges or and also build up more on skills that they're already good at so that they can share these with the kids but basically any way that you do that I think fundraising is the best way to go I'm the last questioner so that concludes your interview and if you'd like to add anything or you think of anything later you're welcome to submit additional comments all to right the same thank place. you and everyone have yes. a great evening. thank you very very much and last, we have Lisa Shore. Welcome. Good evening. It is a dubious honor to be the last person to speak. However, just like on a train, a lot of leadership comes from the caboose. The caboose has all the necessary attributes to keep the train successful and moving forward. Also, when you see the caboose, you know you're almost done. As much as I'd love to stay all night, share my passion, and talk about education in our county, I promise I won't do that to you guys tonight. As I wrote this speech, I wondered what I bring that makes me stand out from the talented folks who have spoken before me. I bounce these attributes against the mission of the Board of Education as stated in the Board Handbook. The mission says to provide leadership, vision, and support to Anne Arundel County Public Schools that ensures an equitable, world-class education and creates lifelong learning by promoting community collaboration, developing responsive policies, and holding ourselves accountable for the results. I have experience with all three of these goals. I've been involved in community engagement and leadership for a long time. Leadership Anne Arundel in 2003, PTA, CAC, the Parent Involvement Advisory Council, jobs with Recreation and Parks, the Public Library, and most recently my participation in the Citizens Police Academy. Throughout these experiences, I've worked hard to reach out to underserved populations and to ensure that all voices are heard. In our county, we have some great collaborative community partnerships that we can build upon, such as the public library's sale cards, the school resource officer program, the arts council's arts and education program, and community-based restorative justice programs like teen court and community conferencing. The second goal, responsive policies, is achieved at Board of Education meetings. I regularly attend these meetings, monitor policies that are up for review, and occasionally provide public testimony, particularly on policies about community engagement and or equity. In addition, as a member of the countywide CAC's equity team, I work closely with the Office of Equity and Accelerated Student Achievement on their work to eliminate the achievement gap. We achieve so much when we work together in ways that are positive, productive, and professional. The third goal, accountability, I bring community connections and existing collaborative, collaborative relationships with the school system. In addition, my PTA and family budgeting experiences provide me with goal setting and fiscal management skills. To move our school system forward, we must continue to build trust and positive relationships between board members and our community. 
Working together, we can build a strong community and successful kids. I appreciate your consideration for the Open Board of Education seat so that I can continue to be part of this journey. Hello, Ms. Shore. Uh, welcome. Thank you. I'm Bill Jones, and I'm the appointee of, uh, to this commission by the Teachers Association of Anne Arundel County. But you and I have got to know each other a little bit through your attendance, regular attendance of board meetings, your periodic testimony, and this is also not the first time that I have interviewed you in this arena. I got to know you a little bit, and I, uh, and I know you to have high regard for public school educators. But as I look through your, your submission and your three goals and your answers to question number two, I didn't see anything regarding recruitment and retention of highly qualified teachers. Within your own personal priorities, where would you have put that? I, I wanted to, in my application, I wanted to emphasize the community piece because I actually think that that's my strength. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I am married to a public school teacher, so that is a strong consideration in our household. Um, and I've attended board meetings when we talk about recruitment and we talk about uh, keeping teachers in our school system. And I think there's a huge community piece to that. Um, I think um, salary is part of it, but I think teachers need to be able to afford to live in Anne Arundel County. We have a great county with lots of resources, but if they can't afford mortgages and rent and, and food, um, then they can't afford to live here. So I think there is a huge community piece to the teacher retention uh, piece and, and recruitment. Um, I also think teachers need um, autonomy and professional development and to feel empowered in school and be able to be decision makers. I think all of us as adults want autonomy. Um, and so I think that's a huge part of it too. I didn't think you were neglecting it. Thank you for confirming that. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Mariko Bennett, and I'm representing the NAACP here this evening. Um, so thank you for your application. Thank you for your responses. And um, I'm going to ask you a question in regards to what you mentioned here in your opening statement as well as um, what you addressed as one of the critical issues um, in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. You talk about um, successful programs in, such as teen court, community conferencing, school resource officers, and student advocates. Um, I actually would not be here before you today representing the NAACP if not for the school resource officer program uh, that I was made aware of because of my own personal situation um, with my child. Um, and so on paper, programs like school resource officers and teen court sound okay. However, in real life and in practice, um, what my family experienced and my, and my son experienced with the school resource officer and what I know nationally because I sat at the White House during criminal justice reform with the former president. Um, and we know that these programs funnel the school to prison pipeline. So I'm gonna ask you a question in regards to suspension in the school, the school to prison pipeline and studies that show the student school resource officer and how they're funneling those students. So how would we ensure that those programs in Anne Arundel County are not funneling our students and our children to uh, the criminal industrial complex, known also as prisons? So how can we ensure that that does not happen? Structured properly, I believe these programs are diversion programs to keep children out of the school to prison pop line, pipeline. Um, in the experience that our family had with the disciplinary pop process in Anne Arundel County Public Schools, um, we found it very punitive, and I would like to change it from being punitive to being um, um, where, where we hold the kids accountable 
for their actions, but they have a chance to fix things. And I think that with some of the restorative justice programs, we can actually do that. Um, it has been proven that uh, um, uh, the predictor of whether or not adults are in prison is whether or not they've had contact with the juvenile justice system. So I would like to have these as diversion programs before the kids hit the juvenile justice system. Community conferencing brings everybody affected by whatever happened to the table to talk and to change that child's behavior so that child can grow and learn and go back into the classroom where they need to be. Right, and so what we want to also, so the, oh, my three minutes are up. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Leanne Carmona, and I represent the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, if you were on the board, would you um, would you support a policy that would limit the amount of time a child spends on a bus to four hours per day? I think that's a huge problem. Um, and I do want to start by saying, first of all, I'm thrilled that um, CCAC is up on the board now. I think that was a missing voice that we weren't hearing. Um, yes, I think that's a problem. Um, um, I was watching the dynamics with the school start later issue and the uh, special schools in Annapolis. The kids were getting there very, very early. By bumping that back so the kids have time to sleep and actually get good quality sleep, they're hitting a lot of traffic. So that could potential be, potentially be a, a problem. So yes, I think we need to seriously look at that issue. I did learn that it is hard to find bus and bus drivers, so it is a complicated issue, um, but we do need to address it. So for the um, for students in non-public schools, it becomes even a greater issue, upwards of five hours per day. Um, so you would def would you look into how to how to bring these students back into our community, or at least? close to our community as a priority? I'm not sure what the solution would be because it depends on the needs of the child. That child's needs may be met best in an out-of-county placement, so I think it's going to be trying to balance a bunch of different issues. Would you would you have a um, number you draw the line at, like six out? I mean, is there a... I think it would be part of, have to be part of a discussion, actually. All right. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. I'm Estefania Holler. I represent the council, County Council PTA. And I know you, you come to all of our meetings, you're part of our board, and I salute you for always constantly being very involved and very knowledgeable of our county. So I wanted to say I wasn't gonna ask you anything because I know you very well, but for reasons for you to be able to express more of your knowledge to everybody around here that may not know. Um, what are your thoughts about the parent community involvement in the decision-making process of the school system? And how would you work to increase and encourage this input to if you were appointed to this position? One of my personal goals is to do a better job of communicating um, each school's school improvement team goals. Um, I think when we have common goals, both as school, um, as PTA, and as community members, then we can all work together. If those goals are not communicated, not brought forward, then the community doesn't know where what their role is and where they can come in and help move everything forward. So that's been that's been a personal goal of mine to try to do that better. So on that note, uh, what would be basically what you would want to accomplish in the short period of time if you were elected into this position? Because it isn't only an 18 month uh, position. I think that would be one of the goals because that would have some longevity to it and some sustainability to it. And I've seen it done in other school districts. I was looking at it, I think, in North Carolina, where they actually, even if it's not the exact goals, a summary of the goals, where so everybody knows where they can jump in and help. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Ms. Shore. I represent uh, Casa de Maryland on this commission. Um, so I want to ask you about what kind of solution you can propose to reaching out to parents of immigrant communities, minority communities, so that they can have a more active role in the student's education. Um, I think I would have a conversation with some of the folks in the Office of School and Family Partnerships. Um, there are some very talented people that work in that office in this county, and some folks that work for our public library that do some great outreach. 
So I would start with some conversations um, to figure out how to get past some of the cultural barriers or some of my things that I don't understand to try to figure out how to do that. Um, I definitely think that we need um, more diversity on our PTAs. Um, and that would certainly be uh, something to strive for. And I just have a, a follow-up question, and it's going to go back to uh, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Bennett's topic there. Um, because a prison to pipeline also affects very much so the immigrant community and his Latino community. And you mentioned that if structured correctly, that these um, solutions work. And what we've seen nationwide is that they're not working. So what kind of restructuring would you propose? I, I don't know how to respond to the fact that you're saying that nationwide they're not working because I do think the school resource officer program in our county prevents a lot of things. I think if the resource officer wasn't there and you get a policeman off the street when, it, when they need a child arrested or, or whatever, it escalates much, much faster. So there's a lot of preventative stuff that happens. Um, I've also seen, I mean, our experience in our family was with teen court and it was very powerful. Um, the kids actually go before a jury of their peers, so the uh, consequences are given to them by teenagers, and the recidivism rate is very, very low. So, um, and community conferencing also has very, very good results, and it diverts kids away from the juvenile justice system, and ultimately the adult justice system. Hi, my name is Josie Araya. We met previously. Uh, and I represent the Chesapeake Regional Association of Student Councils. I'm sure you've seen us uh, testify at the Board of Education. Um, and I like your ideas. They're very unique, especially with regards to the venue for graduation. Um, my question is, um, essentially, could you expand a little bit on the recess guidelines you talk about in one of your goals? And specifically, the follow-up question would be, how would you incorporate as a board member more of the student voice from CRASC or wherever with regards to, the, regards to those guidelines? Um, I think the student voice is very, very important, and I've seen some of the awesome stuff that students have done at board meetings. Um, and I think it's really important to value the student voice because um, it's just like a parent voice. Sometimes it can be uh, dismissed very easily, and we need to um, incorporate it. Um, Recess. My background in training is recreation and parks, and I believe that um, kids need free, unstructured time to make their own decisions, to be active, um, and I need, think we need to have a conversation about it. I'm not sure it's going to be a policy. It may be a guideline, but I think we need to have um, a, a discussion about uh, recess. Uh, we also need to talk about whether or not it's okay to take recess away from children as punishment, because oftentimes we take recess away from kids who need it the most um, and also talk about um, indoor recess plugging in a video um, is not good recess to me um, you know if it's nasty outside but there's all kinds of other things that we could be doing so I think we need to have a conversation about it um, I don't want to come in like I have the solution uh, because I don't I think it's but I think it's a very very important conversation Okay, and another question, since we have time, how would you uh, try to fund the venue? Well, I heard that there was supposed to be something being built uh, near the casino. I'm not quite sure what that is going to look like yet. It looked like it incorporated a parking lot somehow, and I'm a little concerned about how that's going to work with weather, and so I'm not quite sure what that looks like yet, and I would need to, to take a closer look at it, but I know it's very, very needed in this county. All that money goes outside the county, and I know that when my son graduated, um, some students were in an accident on the way to the, the graduation venue. So the farther away we take it, the more um, opportunities there are for something to happen. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, Lisa, how are you? Hi, Allison. As you know, I'm Allison Pickard with the Anne Arundel County Council of PTAs. Um, thank you for uh, once again applying for the board, and thank you for your comments on recess this evening. As you know, we share a um, common concern about recess in our schools, so thank you about that. But my, I'm going to go off the, my PTA questioning, and you do have extensive community engagement on your resume and in your history, and I'd love to know what you think are um, your what is the co accomplishment you're most proud of in some of your community work um 
I have one that I accomplished and one that I hope to accomplish. Um, one that I accomplished was being one of the first rangers that opened Quiet Waters Park and being able to be there and help design how we were going to manage the park and the playgrounds and all that kind of stuff was probably one of the highlights of my career. Um, one that I would like to see accomplished is that we are trying to build a health center next to Van Bachlen Elementary School. Uh, we have some casino funds. We have some uh, political energy behind it. Um, we have the need for it. Um, it's been a long-term project. The community's wanted it for many, many years. We are at a tipping point now, and I hope we will be able to accomplish it. Um, I know I work very closely with a community activist who's wanted something there for about 30 years. And with all your community engagement, uh, I know you're familiar with the role of a board member. Um, do you feel your um, community work and your family life will accommodate the work of a board, a board member, beyond the two meetings a month? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my kids are in college now, um, and I miss kids in my life. Um, and I, my hours at work are very, very flexible, and that's why I love that job that I do, because they are flexible and I can continue to do the community work I like to do. Mr. Chairman, I'm Jerry Klasmeyer with the Anne Arundel County Community College Board of Trustees. The only question I have pertains to, you mentioned that your husband is a teacher in the, in the school system. Mm -hmm. Are there any ethical considerations that you're concerned about with reference to serving on the board in the system where your husband is an employee? Uh, no, because it's been done before. Um, so, and, and if if there, I I feel very, very, very strongly about ethics. So, if there's every ever an ethical dilemma, I certainly would get a guidance on how. So, to somewhere that. there's a decision from somebody that says that's okay. Yeah, it's the as precedents have you know. already been set on that. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Linda Ferrara, and I'm representing the Association of Educational Leaders Administration in Anne Arundel County. I have a three-part question. The first is how to define, how do you define consensus? Um, how do you build it? To part two, and give me an example of how you were able to do this. I see consensus as an agreed upon path forward. And I think it starts with common goals. Um, when my son started at Old Mill High School, he was there a year and they desperately needed a PTA president. I didn't know anybody, <laughs> but I said I would try it. Um, and the reason I wanted to try it was because I wanted to see what would happen if we aligned our PTA with what the principal wanted to accomplish, what his goals were and what the school improvement team goals were. And so uh, we came in and we, we did that. We didn't, you know, not everything aligned 100%, but we aligned with what he wanted to accomplish at his school. So um, by, by collaborating um, and aligning our goals, we could work together collaboratively and move forward. And we got a lot accomplished and we became a very well-functioning PTA. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Penny Cantwell, and I'm here representing the Central Maryland Chamber of Commerce. So um, what I'd like to do is ask you to share your vision and, or a description of what a successful student would look like in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. I have a couple thoughts on that. Um, a successful student would be a lifelong learner um, with a love of learning, ideally, um, an engaged citizen. That's probably my personal bias there. Um, a reader and a problem solver. Um, I also really like the Kids at Hope framework that we use in a lot of our schools. Um, and it's got four main categories of things that the kids need to do to be well-rounded. And that is um, home and family, education and career, community and service, and hobbies and recreation. So basically they're well-rounded individuals and it's more than just academics. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Hi. It's good to see you again. We've been through this process <laughs> previously. Thank you so much for putting in your application and coming down here tonight. Um, I don't have any questions. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Susanna Kipke. I'm a county executive appointee, and I was going to ask you about recess because it's something I, I feel very uh, strongly about, but it's been asked and you answered it very so thoroughly. So I don't have any questions, but uh, thank you very much for being a park ranger. It's a great job. My son is two and a half. I also have a one-year-old, so we're in the park all the time. And he thinks park rangers are just the most amazing people. He follows them around the park. So <laughs> so thank you very much. And I'm last, so that concludes your interview. And if you have anything to add, um, if you think of something later, you're welcome to submit additional comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, that concludes our interviews. <laughs> we will now take uh, public participation. A reminder that public participation is also limited to three minutes. Um, and, and exactly in the way that the uh, candidates have, when you're, you have 30 seconds left, the yellow light will show. When your time is up, the red light will show. So uh, we don't have any particular order and we don't have a sign up. So whoever would like to be first can come up right now. And when you come up, please introduce yourself, tell us your name and, uh, and where you're from. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Kate King, and I am with South County Youth Association, board member, futsal commissioner, and a coach. I am here this evening to speak on behalf of Kevin Jackson. I have been very fortunate to have Kevin Jackson as an assistant and as a head coach while I was a clinic soccer and futsal commissioner. Coach Jackson's energies and excitement glow on and off the field. He encourages the players' desires to work hard and have fun while learning the game and being part of a team. He is the truest definition of a coach. He not only takes the time to individually know what each player needs in skill, fundamentals, and game, but he strengthens their character, builds their confidences, and creates players that are role models on and off the field. Coach Jackson's players never hang their heads low at the loss of a game or game frustrations, but reach out to fellow teammates to build up their, each other identify individual and team opportunities, and are excited to get to work on for improvement. This is an amazing, amazing strength of Coach Jackson and a true testament to the positive influences he has on the players on and off the field. SCYA has been very blessed that he has the energy, organization, and motivation, and determination to make a difference in these young players' lives. During Coach Jackson's first season as county soccer, he asked me to be his mentor for the season as we both had boys' county teams and I was in my fourth season. Throughout this, uh, this season, he would ask me for advice on individual and team strategies, tell me what worked and what had not worked in his practices and games, and what he saw in his players. He would ask for my feedback, listen to my own personal experiences and knowledge and strategies, and ask questions to gather as much knowledge and expertise to properly be prepared and bring his best to his own team. He would then take this knowledge, insights, and ideas and adapt them to his own players, teams, coaches, and himself. He took the time to make himself better, to provide the best experience for his team. Coach Jackson has the motivation to gather better, I'm sorry, he has the motivation to gather as much knowledge as possible, the modesty to make it those with more experience for insight, and determination to make himself better for the play, better of his players and team. Kevin Jackson has also frequented SUI board meetings, not as a coach, but as a parent in our community. He has taken the time to sit in, learn and educate himself to the system, applaud the good work that he sees being done, and chime in where he sees opportunity to improve our club and our children's sports experience. Mr. Jackson motivates our board to want to do better. We are recently in attendance for a board meeting where the tensions and frustrations were running very high. Mr. Jackson, with nothing prepared, took it to the floor to give a tremendous speech. And not only did he sit there and motivate our board to do better, but it resonated with our board members to do and step up to this plate. I have sat on the board for five years and I've never seen the entire room applaud at the end of someone speaking. This is how Mr. Jackson makes you wanna be better. He brings your, out your confidences, your strengths and your determinations. You want to be the amazing person he already sees you are inside. This is the same for our children and as adults. It is a tremendous ability to be and anyone who has the adept Mr. Jackson in their corner or on their team will highly benefit from this skill. Kevin Jackson has a very strong, positive presence in our community, and we have been very fortunate that he has taken the time to share his passion, energy, and motivation with us, and more importantly, our children in the sports environment. And I'm very confident that Kevin Jackson would bring his passion, energy, and motivation to our children's education through his position on the Board of Education. I thank you for your time. Thank you.
Good evening. Hello, my name is Susan Brown and I'm from Annapolis, Maryland. I am here to speak on behalf of Kevin Jackson as a candidate for the Anne Arundel County Board of Education. I'm a retired teacher, yay, from AACPS. I taught science to eighth grade students for almost 20 years in the county. During that time, I became a National Board Certified Teacher. I received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching, and I was an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow working at the National Science Foundation. Kevin Jackson was an Anne Arundel County Board of Education member during my tenure as a teacher. As a teacher, I found Kevin to be hardworking, ethical, energetic, and effective as a member of the Board of Ed. I have known Kevin Jackson for more than 20 years. We became his sponsors as he attended the Annapolis Naval Academy. I introduced Kevin to his wife, a fellow teacher at Central Middle School, who was also the daughter of a beloved Mayo Elementary School teacher. And I attended the, two births, the births of his two children, Brady and Kaylee. During that time, my initial high regard of this exceptional man has only increased. The first characteristic you notice about Kevin is his friendliness and warm regard for his fellow human beings. He is truly interested in other people. This quality translates into the ability to understand many points of view. He is optimistic and believes that we can make our school system better. His optimism and friendliness means that he can help establish and maintain a positive climate within the school system and help to build rapport among the stakeholders. Kevin lives in Harwood with his two children, and his two children are in a wife and are attending public school this year. He is, he is one of the stakeholders in our school system with a vested interest in making our school system the best in the state and in the country. Kevin has deep roots in Anne Arundel County education. Another of Kevin's characteristics is his energy. His energy is amazing. During his first tenure as a school board member, Kevin was indefatigable. He never stopped trying to implement his vision for Anne Arundel County. Kevin was always well informed about the issues facing public education and worked tirelessly to find and implement so solutions to those issues. There is no other candidate for this position like Kevin Jackson, who has already proven himself as a valuable addition to Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Kevin is familiar with the issues facing our county, and with his two children in the school system, he is more passionate than ever about improving our schools. Kevin Jackson would be the best choice for AACPS Board of Education member. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to make public comments? Uh, my name is Jim Snyder and I'm following up on my June 6, 2017 public testimony before this public body. At your June 19th meeting, the chair reported that there were no public comments regarding the proposed bylaws. I would like to correct the public record. At the June 6th meeting, I submitted extensive testimony on how to fix the school board appointment commission's procedures in light of the experience of the previous school board nominating commission. I specifically asked the chair to submit that written testimony as part of the public record, and she agreed. In that submission, I made several recommendations to amend the previous bylaws, including one that affected the chair's excessive powers over information. None of my recommendations were implemented. If the SBAC is interested in understanding why during its first six public meetings, or say five meetings, only two members of the public testified five meetings, the response to my June 6 testimony may provide a clue. People want to get the feeling that they are genuinely listened to as opposed to just getting a smile. Along those lines, I request that the minutes of the June 6 meeting be modified to disclose the submission on the public record of my substantial and expert written testimony concerning the SBAC's procedures. An irony here is that the chair was furious when I reported to the press that the previous commission had violated its own rules by not holding two public hearings before nominating school board candidates to the governor. She told me that I should have given her a heads up before releasing that information to the press and causing so much havoc. But for months I had asked the previous commission's leadership for permission to present my procedural observations and could even get my emails returned, let alone get on the agenda. 
However, after the nominations were thrown into disarray because of the Commission's procedural violation, I was finally allowed to present my testimony, which I had written some six months before. One last point. It is an essential design element of democracy that the people can detect material conflicts of interest among their representatives, including school board candidates. The law states that AACPS employees are ineligible to serve as school board members, but it leaves as a matter of ethics whether a school board member's spouse, children, and other close relatives who work for AACPS present an unacceptable conflict of interest. Every conflict of interest disclosure system I know of for top government officials addresses such potential family conflicts. But SBAC's application system ignores them. Candidates have usually not disclosed or highlighted this information in either their applications or public testimony, with several exceptions during this round. And the local newspaper, which merely summarizes how the candidates present themselves, has never disclosed this information. Thus, this information should be included on the candidate application form. To be fair, during its final years, the School Board Nominating Commission did a good job of discreetly addressing this conflict of interest problem. Notably, the school board went from a majority of adult board members with such conflicts to none today. That saved the school board from many potentially embarrassing situations. But the impact you should care most about concerns the public. The public should have the information it needs to assess whether the Board of Education is trustworthy. If potentially material information is hidden from them, they should, they should not have that trust. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. And lastly, just on relationship to your next round, of, 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 of elections, I would encourage you to use rank choice voting rather than the current system, which encourages insincere voting. And I don't think that insincere voting is something that you want to encourage. So I would look forward to a more sophisticated, a, a, a better voting system than the one you're going to be implementing for this round. So that's for the future. So if you have any questions, I would be welcome uh, to take them. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Is there any other public testimony? All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out for four nights in a row and for your succinct questions and for making this a, a very pleasant experience. And thank the, I would like to thank the Board of Education staff and especially Bob Moser for his help making this all go smoothly. I agree with you. On that note, on my traditional saying, I motion to adjourn this meeting. Is there a second? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Opposed?